Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go over that a little bit more uh, towards the end of the class. But anyway, I want to uh, finish up with what we're talking about here with the culture industry. So I think it's a very you know, fascinating concept. Um, it is you know, probably the most important aspect of the Frankfurt School. It's probably what they're most known for. Um, so we'll finish going through that. You know, I'd like to show some examples of some of the, the, the cultural aspects that Adorno references as, as well as we've gone over in previous classes. So I think this is pretty much where, where we left off, right? This idea that the, the culture industry, where, where it really gets its name from, essentially what makes it industrial, according to Adorno, is that it is um, standardized. Um, it basically produces, you know, nearly identical products that all, you know, exist primarily to make make a profit. You know, the the, the actual artistic considerations, the the artistic impulses that normally go into producing art, are really, you know, either nowhere to be found or very, you know, far down down the list of priorities here. Right. The fir first and foremost, the culture that's produced by the culture industry is a commodity, right? And it exists solely to make profit. So he examines that, uh, Adorno and, and Horkheimer, he examined, they examine that. Um, and and, and what, what I think are really the, the sort of harmful effects that, that it has upon people. Let me just get my phone real quick. So you better keep track of time. Um, all right, so, um, which, you know, again, I think is a very, you know, important thing. I think it's very, um, much you know relevant uh, in today's world as well, obviously, because you know we we are sort of living now you know several generations in into this, and and I, you know I know it's kind of you know easy to like you know make fun of the baby boomers and, and things like that, especially if you're a millennial or whatever. But you know I mean the baby boomers are you know essentially the the first generation of Americans to be you know raised almost entirely by 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 the culture industry by television, by things like that. And, you know, I mean, look, 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 look at the state of the country under, under their, uh, you know, reign or stewardship of, of, of the country. This seems that there's a lot of things that have gone wrong, you know, over the last several decades in this country. Does that have anything to do with the fact uh, you, you know, can that be related to the, the influence of mass culture in contemporary American life? Maybe, I mean, certainly it's, it's worth, uh, examining, you know, there are probably other things to play a role as well, but it, it, it does seem to have an impact. So again, what makes it industrial in the sense that he's talking about it is basically the, the sort of, you know, standardized uh, approach to culture that you see here. Let me let some more people in the room. Um, all right. So, all right, going on. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, the culture industry is is basically made up of a fairly small handful of corporations in, in the various you know aspects of mass culture film studios record labels things like that um now adorno talks about their sort of dependence on even larger corporations which i think is true i mean you know most notable example probably is uh General Electric for years basically owned NBC, or obviously one of the largest television networks. Um, they still, you know, have a very strong minority interest in the company, even even today. I mean, it was kind of a controversial thing that you have this company, which, by the way, you know, besides being a consumer electronics uh, corporation, is also one of the largest military contractors in the United States as as well. So you have this very powerful corporation, which, um, you know, plays a very big role in, 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 in the television industry and, and everything, you know, associated with that. Um, now, in our world, you know, today, I mean, the consolidation of culture, you know, in, in even smaller hands is, is very much a prevalent thing. So, for example, when the so-called telecommunications industries were deregulated, in the late 1990s, one of the many, you know, star, uh, sparkling achievements of the Clinton administration. I think there were about, from what I read, something about like 50 or so media companies 
in, in the United States that were more or less independent of, of each other. You know, again, spanning the various aspects of popular culture. Uh, today, there's about five, <laughs> basically five company, five, five or six, but I think it's, it's, it's like five, basically control um, uh, pretty much like 90% of media in this country. And of course, you know, Disney's being, Disney is the largest one. Um, News Corporation, the company owned by Rupert Murdoch, you know, Time Warner. Um, um, what's the one that owns uh, CBS? Is it, it's not Comcast. Comcast owns NBC nowadays. Um, I'm blanking on the name. Well, so Adrian asks, would you say who influences the modern standardized culture has changed? Well, uh, before, as you said, it's mostly media companies that frame culture, but doesn't social media and younger kids also have a hand in it now? Well, yeah, but that's an interesting thing. How much influence does that really have? Um, and I would like to talk about that later on because um, there, there's a quote actually by um, Benjamin that I don't think I, I got to when we talk about in class. It's, 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 it's in the PowerPoint. But I don't think, you know, like many things, I, I had a chance to actually address it in, in class. It is in the readings, of course, and I did include the quote in the PowerPoint, but he talks about how people basically trade or, or, or are, you know, given means of self-expression as, 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 as kind of a poor compensation for, for lack of like basic human rights and things like that. I think, and he, and he associates that with fascism as well, which I think is a very interesting way of looking at it. So, you know, as that relates to contemporary society now, I mean, isn't that kind of what we have? Isn't that kind of the role that social media plays? It gives us a means of self-expression maybe, but to compensate for the fact that, we, you know, we basically lack basic human rights, especially here in the United States, healthcare, education, housing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, if, if you look at it that way, the fact that people are allowed to post pictures of, of themselves or, you know, whatever, as, as, a, as a kind of compensation for not having healthcare, I, I think that's a very poor trade-off. At least that's the way I, I look at it. Um, but we can, you know, we can talk about that more or you know I'm, I'm interested in you know what other people think about that i mean i mean what what what, what positive role do you think so, social media really plays i mean you could probably make a pretty good argument it, it helped donald trump get elected president <laughs> i mean i don't know if that's a positive thing i would say probably not other 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 than that i mean what are what are the great you know achievements what are the great you know benefits that really come about uh from social media and you know i i'll, I'll say i'm probably a little bit biased here i i, I mean i'm not really on social media, I don't really have much use for it. Um, another thing that, that isn't so great that came out is cancel culture. Yeah, and I think to some extent that pre predated social media, but yeah, certainly it, it became sort of amplified, definitely with uh, social media. So I, I don't know, you know, I, 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 I have a much more sort of, you know, pessimistic uh, take on social media. Um, I think I've learned a lot about other, other cultures. Well, okay, so that might be one positive benefit. Um, but again, I, you know, as, as, as far as like a, a compensation for not having like healthcare or something like that, I don't, I don't think it's really a good, uh, you know, trade-off as far as that goes. Um, anyway, yeah. So if you have other things to say, you know, in, in, in the chat, just, uh, write them or, you know, you can speak up as well, obviously. Uh, he also references this idea of you know, um, people in, in, in the culture industry not wanting to be seen sort of as too Jewish, or that's like sort of, you know, paraphrasing what, what he says about there. And I think that's also an interesting point. Again, Adorno and, and Horkheimer are themselves Jewish. You know, many of the German um, refugees, basically, that, that left Germany, you know, during the war, or, you know, before the war, I should say, um, were, of course, Jewish background. Uh, people like Benjamin also, you know, did not make it out alive. But there's an, an, you know, a perception of people that, you know, Hollywood even to, to this day has a very strong sort of, you know, Jewish element to it. And, and if that is true, um, there are probably good historical reasons for it. I mean, I mean, the reason why a lot of Jewish people did get involved, at least early on in the movie industry, is because frankly, there weren't a lot, you know, there weren't many other avenues open for Jewish people. We were, we were living in a fairly, you know, explicitly, you know, anti-Semitic society, and, and probably not as much, you know, today, to some extent. But, you know, this is an era where, where, where Jewish people had to, you know, change their names to sound less, less ethnic. 
Um, yeah, you know, at the same time, at least they they could do that to sort of you know pass as as they call it through mainstream society. Obviously, other people you know of different skin colors uh, you know were not allowed to do that to a certain extent. Not that all Jewish people are white yeah, either, but you know a lot of them were that that came over from Europe. Um, City College, you know, for 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 many years was known as the Jewish Harvard City College in New York. Um, at at a time where Jewish people were literally barred from going to Harvard, you know, you, you, you were not allowed, or they had a very, you know, like sort of like strict quota basically on how many, you know, Jewish students they would allow in, in, into Harvard. So many Jewish people did get involved in industries like the movie business because they weren't allowed to participate in other aspects. And believe it or not, you know, back then, I'm talking about like the early 1900s, 1910s, you know, 1920s, there, there, thereabouts, the movie business was seen as sort of like a not respectable business. I mean, maybe it still isn't, but I mean, it's at least a very profitable business. Um, so that was one of the few, you know, areas where, where, where Jewish people could make some kind of inroads into, uh, because it was one of the few aspects of life that was not, you know, specifically prohibited to them. Um, so he, he, he references this fact that, you know, the, the sort of so-called Jewish intellectualism that, that you see in some aspects of mass culture, you know, they, they want to, um, you know, not, um, not offend, you know, the powerful people all, all that much. And he does talk about, you know, like I said, the dependence of the most powerful broadcasting company on the electrical industry. Um, I, I would, I would bet anything that, they, that that is explicitly a reference to NBC, which, which started out as NBC radio as well before television and general electric who, who basically owned them for, you know, many, uh, many decades or of film on um, the banks characterizes the whole sphere, the individual sectors of, of which are themselves economically intertwined. And, and yeah, and that is true as well. I mean, I mean, most aspects of mass culture, you know, depend upon, you know, financing from banks and, you know, simply put, they don't want to offend the people that uh, loan them credit, you know? So you're not going to maybe see a lot of content that's, you know, critical of banking, of the, you know, economic system that, 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 you know, banks sort of sit on top of, you know, especially in this era of financial capitalism that we see ourselves in now. And again, I mean, I, you know, the only other thing I, I can add to that is that the media is even more concentrated now than it was in the 1940s, right, when Adorno was writing this. Um, so, yeah, and, and this is, you know, all obviously from, from the chapter on uh, dialectic of Enlightenment. The the other essay, the culture industry reconsidered. You know, I'm not sure if, if if we'll get a chance to talk about it, just because you know, oftentimes I get caught up talking about other other things. But um, um, it was written in in the late 1960s. Uh, I, th I think the, the version that we have was published in a in a in a magazine called New German Critique in uh, I think 1975. Um, it's, it's, it's in many ways sort of just a restatement of what you see here. Um, after reading both, you know, recently again for class, I mean, I think, I think the second essay is, is, is it's, it's shorter. It's only about like seven pages long, um, but it's a much more sort of streamlined in, in some sense, more stripped down and, and kind of more coherent um, take on the culture industry than what you, than what you see here, which, which, which tends to kind of, you know, I don't say ramble about, but I mean, I mean, there's a sort of a looseness to the narrative here, which is kind of characteristic of Adorno and Horkheimer's writing. Um, so if you find this, basically, long story short, you know, if 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 you found this chapter hard hard to read, maybe maybe the 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 other Adorno essay is a little more um, accessible. It's still kind of you know dense because that's Adorno's style style of writing, but uh, at least it's a fairly short essay, and and it does, I think provide a little more of a coherent take on the culture industry. Um, it's also basically his, his more or less last statement on it. I mean, I mean, the essay is written in 1967. Adorno dies in 1969. So it's, it's, it's pretty much his sort of final statement on it, written you know, roughly 25 years or so, basically, after, after, after this essay was written. Um, and you can see not a lot has changed, right? right? Adorno and Horkheimer mentioned in the preface to, to this book that, that you know, obviously not everything that, that they wrote in, in, in the 1940s would hold up today, this is from, uh, from, from the preface that, that, that they wrote in the late 1960s, um, at least as far as the culture industry goes, you know, not, not a lot has 
change. I mean, I, I, I couldn't really see a significant difference in tone from what Adorno was saying here in the 1940s and what he's saying basically in the late 1960s. Um, anyway, so that aside, so, you know, one of the aspects of it, one of the most important aspects of it is, is how ex expansive the culture industry is, right? Um, it provides something for everybody. And, and here, here again, I think this very much anticipates sort of modern day culture now, which, which has very much sort of, you know, broken things down into various types of so-called niche markets, right? It's like, oh, you like, you know, sports, here's, you know, endless amounts of sports content. Oh, you like cars, here's, you know, oh, you like arts and crafts, you know, it, you like fishing, you like, you know, whatever. You like politics, here, here's 24 seven cable news networks where they basically just, you know, say, say the same shit over, over and over again. Um, there is something for everybody. Every, every need, every, every sort of consumer need that can be identified at least is, is provided for. And he's talking about it, you know, again here. Well, uh, I mean, let me, let me read out the quote. So he says, the hierarchy of serial qualities pervade to the public serves only to quantify it more completely. So here again, we got this, you know, theme of, you know, quantity versus quality. Um, everyone is supposed to behave spontaneously according to a level determined by indices and to select the category of mass product manufactured for their type. So this idea is this kind of controlled spontaneous behavior. Um, it's not really spontaneous, but it's meant to you know, give you the impression of being spontaneous. And again, it's, it's sort of this expansive thing which uh, meets every person. Oh, you like jazz music? Oh, you like classical music? You know, you like books? You, you, you know, whatever it is. Uh, whatever you, you would consider, you know, you know, fine art, elevated art, you know, vulgar art, you know, vulgar habits and pastimes and things like that. Everything is, you know, provided for basically. And everyone, you know, as, as a consequence, then, you know, gets kind of su sucked into this. You, you learn to just sort of, you know, satisfy your needs through these various consumer uh, desires. And again, going back to this idea of standardization, you know, one of the things that stands out most about the culture industry is, is how almost unbearably cliched and formulaic it is, right? Everything is the same. Everything sort of follows the, 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 the more or less, you know, sim similar formula for whatever it is, whether it's music or movies. Uh, so again, as he says here, uh, in, in a film, the outcome can invariably be predicted at the start, who will be rewarded, punished, forgotten, and in light music, the prepared ear can always guess the continuation after the first bars of a hit song and is gratified when it actually occurs. Uh, the average choice of words in a short story must not be tampered with. The gags, in effect, are no less calculated than their framework. They are managed by special experts and their slim variety is specifically tailored to the office pigeonhole. The culture industry has developed in conjunction with the predominance of the effect, the tangible the tangible performance, the technical detail over the work, which once carried the idea and was liquidated with it. Uh, so basically what, what he's saying is that, you know, the techniques of, you know, production are, are, are basically, you know, have no real relationship anymore toward, you know, to the work as, as, as a whole, but basically are just there to, you know, as a means of advertisement, as a means of, again, sort of sucking people in, um, with the spectacle of it, essentially. And again, I think, you know, especially the, the early part of, of this quote is, is very much true. How many movies have, have, have you seen where you can almost exactly predict how the story is going to play out? Whether it's an action movie, whether it's a romantic comedy or any, you know, anything like that. Um, you can pretty much figure out, you know, almost like when exactly certain moments are going to occur. You know that, you know, the young lovers are going to have, you know, a, a breakup or something like that, you know, roughly an hour in, in, into the movie or something like that, and then spend the last, you know, 30 minutes, you know, get, getting, getting back together or, or something like that. You know, at what point exactly, you know, the, you know, Bruce Willis is going to, you know, get, uh, you know, ambushed by the, you know, by the bad guys or, or something like that. I'm going to have to sort of, you know, find some way out of whatever situation he's in. And, and, you know, especially with like action movies, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, and I grew up watching these things just like anybody else from my age group, whatever, but I, I, I can't imagine how people can really get excited by watching an action movie. I mean, there's just no suspense at all. I mean, you know that nothing is going to happen. You know that, 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 that the hero of the movie is going to, um, is, is going to prevail. You know that there are no real danger. You know that 
Bruce Willis or wh- whoever, Chris Evans, let's, let's update a little bit more, you know, the, 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 they're not going to get like killed off, like, you know, ha- halfway through, halfway through the movie or anything like that. So I just don't understand where any kind of real tension comes from. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just the spectacle of watching, you know, things blow up basically. And maybe whatever, you know, so-called witty, you know, like dialogue is, is there. As well. So uh, Adrian says, isn't that because it's what will sell mean that ultimately the consumer determines the culture? Well, that's that's actually explicitly something that Adorno reacts very strongly against. Right. This idea that the people who run the the culture industry rationalize it by saying, well, this is what people want. Um, He says, no, you know, that the people who run the culture industry ultimately shape what what people want. That They just offer this stuff over and over and over again and people become, you know, conditioned to it basically. And so they think they want that. They think they want that because, you know, they don't really can even imagine any, anything else. So it just becomes this sort of endless repetition of producing the same old, same old. Um, so yeah, at, at several points actually through, you know, he, he, he kind of reacts against the, that, that, that idea that, that, that um, you know, people are rationalized, like I said, by just, you know, giving people what they want. Um, so people are essentially just given one one choice. Well, you have again lots of different choices, but it's all about you know sort of breaking people up into into their different niches. You know whatever whatever your interests are, we have something for you. It's not just er- everyone likes likes the same thing. Um, especially you know more so now. I mean there was probably an era where you know there was a very narrow view of what were considered you know classic movies and you know like th- things like that nowadays with like you know 5000 cable channels and things like that there are much more different sort of niches which you sort of divide people into but the idea is that no matter what niche you fall into it's just the same old stuff it's the same sort of hi- hi- hierarchical top down sort of junk junk culture and it does you know at some places refer to it as uh, trash basically it's the same kind of trash basically that's just offered to different sort of demographic groups. Um, and again, and, and the people have very little say or impact on what is offered, offered, offered to them. It's more or less what they're sort of just, you know, conditioned to, to like, basically. Um, so again, as he says here, you know, the withering of imagination and spontaneity in the consumer of culture today need not be traced back to psychological mechanisms, the products themselves, especially the most characteristic, the sound film, cripple those faculties through their objective makeup. They are so constructed that their adequate comprehension requires a quick, observant, knowledgeable cast of mind, but positively debars the spectator from thinking if he is not to miss the fleeting facts. So here, you know, I mean, Adorno is basically saying that sound films in particular kind of make people more passive, that they're just sort of receiving things. Now, I actually think he is kind of wrong here. I mean, I think, I think you know, and this is sort of the early days of sound film, you know, the 1940s, uh, had only been around just a little over a decade at that point. Um, I don't think that, you know, sitting and watching a movie necessarily makes you dumb, which is essentially what he's saying, you know, the withering of imagination and spontaneity. I think that is true to a certain extent. I think there is sort of a lack of imagination and spontaneity in a lot of people. I don't know if it necessarily comes from watching sound films in particular. I think it's more, in other words, what, what he's saying here is that it's it's the form, right? That the form of a sound film, as opposed to other media, kind of has a negative impact. I'm much more inclined to think it's the content. It's not necessarily that people are watching a movie that has sound, but it's what the actual content of the movie is. If anything, that that that's what leads to the sort of you know lack of imagination that you see in a lot of people, and and you know the, the political consequences of this are important as well because it's not just a question of being you know a cultural snob although it's easy to paint Adorno in that way, but at several places you know he he does r- relate this back to the political consequences to to how this impacts a democracy or even how it impacts how people understand. Capitalism. I think you know, lack of imagination is is a very you know important aspect of that. Um, it's it's been said, you know, before that it, it's easier for, for people to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism, which I think is an interesting idea, and I think that's probably true, right? I mean, it's easy for people to imagine, you, you know, again, and, and this you, you probably can thank movies to a certain extent. It's easier to pe- for people to imagine some sort of catastrophic apocalypse that you know ends human life on the planet or, you know, puts us in some sort of, you know, Mad Max uh, 
dystopian future world or, or, or something like that, whether it's through nuclear war, whether it's through, you know, an, an asteroid hitting the planet. <laughs> uh, you know, in the late 90s, there were like several movies about that, Armageddon, Deep Impact, and, and, and probably many others. Um, or of course, some kind of, you know, uh, in, environmental catastrophe brought about by, you know, climate change. Or something like that. It's, it, it, it probably is easier for, for people to imagine something like that happening than imagine what it, would, what it would be like to live in a society where people were treated like human beings, to live in a society where we were not just all, you know, objectified and reduced to a commodity, to live in a society that actually fulfilled human needs. Um, I, I think that's true. I think it's very, you know, I, I forgot who first said it. I mean, it's not Adorno, it's, you know, somebody else, but I think it very much relates to, to the kind of things that he's talking about here. I, I, I think that is true. I mean, at least based on what I've seen that um, it probably is hard for a lot of people to imagine something like that. And, 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 and it is easier in a sense to imagine, you know, the end, you know, the end of the world, basically. And again, you can thank the endless amounts of uh, Hollywood uh, disaster movies for that, I guess. Um, yeah, all right. So, so Adorno is, 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 is kind of negative towards film in, in particular. And, and although, you know, in, in his later days, he did kind of come out a little bit for the uh, French director, Jean-Luc Godard, who have never seen any of his movies, you know, made, made some pretty interesting films. Uh, he's, still, he's still alive, actually. He's in his 90s. I don't think he makes movies anymore, but he was up until fa fairly recently. Um, he also, you know, was somewhat positive of, of, of a movement in German cinema known as the new, known as the new German cinema also basically coming about in the 1960s. So he did somewhat revise his opinions on film a little bit. But for the most part, you know, especially for, for films coming out of Hollywood, uh, was pretty negative towards throughout all his life, which ironically, a lot of the French directors like, like Adar did actually, you know, really enjoy those Hollywood movies, you know, those sort of classic ones from, from the 1940s and stuff. But one person that he does mention, and I always, you know, focus in on the specific references that Adorno does make to, to, to the culture at that time, just because obviously a lot of what he says is fairly abstract and can be very dense. So I'm always sort of intrigued when, when he does actually mention specific aspects of the culture. So one of the things that he does mention, or, or one of the people that he does mention is Orson Welles, who, if you've never heard of him before, is a very famous, uh, you know, was a very famous director. Um, was most known for directing the movie Citizen Kane. I don't know if anyone has ever seen seen that movie before. Uh, I mean, you know, what can you say? I mean, for for many years, it was considered the greatest movie ever made. Obviously, when you hype something up like that, you know, you're you're only you know like begging for 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 people to kind of you know tear it down and say it's overrated and things like that. And I think that is more the the opinion a lot of people have, not not necessarily everyone has. Um, has anyone ever seen it by any chance? Just out of curiosity, or seen anything else by Orson Welles? Because he did direct a lot of movies besides Citizen Kane was his first movie, and it's the movie he's most known for. He directed it when he was in his twenties. He was very young. Wells was considered something of a, 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 you know, like a prodigy or something like that. He's probably also most known for the famous War of the Worlds broadcast on radio, where he basically convinced a significant portion of, of the country that, that the, you know, the United States was being invaded by Martians. Um, so, um, you know, is it the greatest movie ever, ever made? I mean, I, you know, I don't think anyone can really an answer that question. Um, I think it's a great movie. I think I think it definitely holds up well. I don't think it's over overrated, um, in, in 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 the fact that it's not like an enjoyable movie to to watch. I actually think it's very relevant to today's world because it's essentially about a guy who you know it's sort of loosely based. Um, it's sort of loosely based on the life of William Randolph Hearst, who was a very famous newspaper publisher and aspiring politician. And, you know, essentially it's, 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 it's about this very powerful guy who has a very strong influence over the media and what people know and what people talk about and what sort of, you know, frames the national discussion on many issues. And it's sort of his, his sort of rise and fall in many ways. Um, so, I, you know, in terms of content, I think it's very much relevant today, uh, maybe now more so than ever. Um, in some ways, you know, in terms of the themes that it addresses in its narrative, I think it's, it's, it's very similar to shows like 
Succession, for for example, uh, the HBO series. Although that shows a, a lot more, you know, pessimistic. I I would say even nihilistic, maybe in so, in some regards. But I think what the movie, the 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 legacy of the movie really comes from, you know, sort of the technical achievements that the film was able to achieve at that time, um, which are you know. Hard to harder to appreciate now because they've become so much sort of you know you know integrated into into, into movie making. Uh, I mean, almost any director of note, you know, even today though, of course, would, would cite Wells as important influence, whether it's Martin Scorsese or uh, you know Stanley Kubrick, who's who's no longer around, but you know various people like that. Uh, what's that guy? Christopher Nolan. Many people do. Quentin, Quentin Tarantino does it. Quentin Tarantino is kind of, you know, sort of very uh, idiosyncratic, sort of quirky tastes in movie, which are, in movies, which I think is very interesting. But most, but most directors do. Um, anyway, Adorno also apparently does not share that esteem for Wells. And and you know, by the way, he did, like I said, direct many other films. So what 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 he says about Wells here is that uh, Orson Wells is forgiven all his offenses against the usages of the craft because as calculated rudeness, they conform the validity of the system all the, all, the more, all, the more, all the more zealously. And I think what he's saying here is that Wells, you know, who was seen as different at, 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 at the time, his style of directing was very much, you know, a departure from what most other people were doing at that time. And I think what he's saying is that, you know, he's forgiven his offenses, meaning that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll They'll tolerate him to, you know, be a little weird or do, you know, the things that he's doing here, um, because it sort of becomes absorbed into 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 the system, as he says, and basically just sort of, you know, gives you this. It, it strengthens the system because it shows you, wow, look, you know, look at all, all all the stuff that we have here to offer. Here, you don't like, you know, you know, you you don't like you don't like this director. You can watch this guy and see. You can watch this guy worse and well. So it it, it gives you the illusion again, of having more, more choices that, 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 than you actually have, giving you the impression that there's more variety than what's actually offered. Now, that being said, I, I, th I think that's an important insight. And I think there's a lot to that, that the culture industry is able to sort of, you know, expand outwards and almost like consume even, you know, artistic movements that happen outside of the mainstream culture. In, in modern day terms, I, 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 I always think of things like, you know, punk, and hip hop, right? Things that sort of, you know, developed outside of the mainstream. And then in a fairly short amount of time, you know, became sort of, you know, co-opted and sort of got, you know, sort of absorbed by the mainstream where they kind of still sort of exist, you know, you know, today. Uh, so, so that insight, I think, is an important insight. As far as Wells himself goes, I don't think it's actually true because it doesn't seem to fit in with Wells's actual career, which the fact of the matter is that Wells was not well tolerated by the culture industry. Uh, his first movie, Citizen Kane, came out. It was critically acclaimed. It did not do, you know, financially well. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the war, you know, going on at at that time. It came out in the in the, I think the end of nineteen forty one. Um, but for many years, it sort of passed into obscurity. Um, and then Wells' the second movie, a very underrated movie called The Magnificent. Ambersons, which actually has to deal with the in invention of the automobile, which is also very, you know, relevant to today's world, um, had his ending sort of, you know, uh, change basically against, against his will. And from that point on, he, he very much sort of existed really outside of the mainstream. I mean, I mean, I mean, he made, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a shame that he's only really remembered today for the movie Citizen Kane because he made a lot of great movies, but most of them were made outside of the United States. And, 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 and by most accounts, he kind of struggled to find financing. So this idea that, you know, it, through various, you know, Euro European backers and, and things like that. So by all accounts, he, he wasn't just sort of absorbed into the system. The culture industry kind of, you know, he was, he was not, as, as it says here, forgiven for his offenses. He, 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 was, he was not forgiven, actually. You know, he was kind of driven out of, you know, Hollywood in many regards. And kind of forced to sort of, you know, struggle, like I said, to find ways to make his movies, many of which are very good. Um, so I think, you know, this insight, this, this, this idea that the culture industry can always sort of expand and even like absorb into it, you know, e even stuff that's not just produced as junk, even stuff that has legitimate artistic merit or value can be sort of absorbed into the system and sort of, you know, 
drained of its meaning, drained of, of its content, become just another commodity, basically, I think is true. But it is interesting how, how the career of Wells himself kind of played out. I, I don't think that actually matches up with what Adorno is, is talking about here. So um, yeah, so if you've never seen it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a movie worth watching. It's very important, you know, in the you know, the history of, of movies. And, and like I said, I think, it, you know, it's not just, so, sometimes saying that something's historically important is almost like the kiss of death because it, it makes you think that it's not, you know, it's it's only valued for its historical importance. But I, I still, I actually think it's, it's still a movie that holds up pretty well. It's worth worth watching as, as are, you know, many of his other movies as well. Um, so here he talks about, you know, the importance of style. And this sort of, you know, again, we're back to this idea of sort of form and content. Style being basically form, you know, the form of art, the, the, the shape and structure that the art takes, and, and, and the actual content, the actual sort of meaning of, of, of the art. Um, so Adorno writes, he says that the great artists were never those who, whose works embodied style in its least fractured, most perfect form, but those who adopted style as a rigor to set against the chaotic expression of suffering as a negative truth. Uh, so that's a very strong phrase, right? The chaotic expression of suffering as a negative truth. Basically, by 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 being critical of society, you know, you're you're sort of revealing a truth about things. And in and in the other essay, the culture industry reconsidered. Ordona speaks of 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 great works of art, um, sort of as, as he says, raising a protest against the petrified relations of society that the people find themselves in, or or, or something to that extent. Uh, but this idea of raising a protest against, you know, a petrified society, I, I think also speaks to this, you know, very, very similar to what he's saying here is that you're giving, you're basically giving a voice to the voices, right? You're giving expression to people who are not normally able to express themselves the, 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 and, and revealing truths about, about the world that are usually kind of, you know, concealed by people in power. Um, and I think it, it really, it, you know, it speaks to this idea, what, you know, when people say that, oh, my art, you know, I don't like political art or my art's not political and, and things like that. Well, then you're not an artist, right? I mean, all art is political. At least that's what, you know, Adorno would say. And Benjamin and various other people like that. All art is political, even if it's not explicitly political. And oftentimes it is. But even if, if, if it isn't, it's, it's uh, again, giving a, a kind of expression to something which, which isn't normally expressed in society. And, and, and in that regard alone, it is political because it is sort of raising a critical view of the society, which of course, every society is held together by politics. So you're always, you know, sort of in, implicitly, you know, critiquing the politics of a society as, as well. That being said, I mean, a lot of the works that, that they're talking about does have a, a fairly you know, strong political content to it. Although we'll, we'll, we'll look at an example in a moment, which may sort of, you know, challenge the idea, like how, how explicit are the politics in it, especially in, in, for, in forms like music. Um, but again, you know, it, it is kind of, you know, like laughable, you know, this notion that art isn't political or shouldn't be political or that, you know, it's, it's a choice if it's, you know, political or not. Basically what he's saying is that all, you know, true art, all genuine art always has, you know, a political aspect to it. Um, but also what he's saying here about style is, uh, you know, essentially what, what people would, you know, often re refer to as, you know, style over substance, which again, is kind of what you get a lot in the culture industry, right? You have stuff that's very, you know, technically competently done and competently, competently well-made in terms of, you know, well, to look at film, you know, the, the, you know, the filmmaking techniques, the camera work, the special effects, obviously plays a big part in that. All, all, all that technical aspects are, all those technical aspects are there, but what you're missing often or not, more often than not, is substance, right? And it's something that actually, again, re reveals an important truth about, uh, about the world. Usually it's just the same kind of, you know, formulaic, you know, crap, basically, which doesn't really say anything. Or, or which even worse, basically just sort of reaffirms the values of the status quo. Um, so again, a lot of what we get is style over substance. I would say, you know, to, 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 to give some examples, flesh that out a little bit more. I mean, I know a lot of people like the guy, uh, Christopher Nolan, his movies, you know, to me, I, I mean, a lot of his movies seem like style over substance. Um, you know, again, technically very well made, competent, um, but oftentimes I think, you know, the, the, the dialogue in, in, in the movie seems kind of forced, unrealistic, the, the, the way the characters act, 
you know, they're, they're, they they act in sort of, you know, bizarre ways to kind of move the story along, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, it's hard to express that any, 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 any more clear. It's been a while since I've seen any of his movies, but that, but that was kind of the impression I would get seeing some of his movies. And, you know, this is the guy that did all those Batman movies, but then he's done other movies like in, Interstellar and uh, the one um, about the illusionist, I think it was called or something like that. And Dunkirk was, was another one. So that'd be one example. I mean, Steven Spielberg maybe could be another example of that. Um, again, style over substance, things that are technically well, well made, but doesn't really have any real substance to it. Doesn't, doesn't really, again, express an, an important truth about, about the world. Um, anyway, going on what he says. In the style of these works, ex expression took on the strength without, without which existence is dissipated, unheard. So again, giving a voice to the voiceless. Uh, even works which are called classical, like the music of Mozart, contain objective tendencies which resist the style they incarnate. So what he's saying about Mozart here is that he's not just consumed by style. You know, I, I, mean, I mean, style is, is, is sort of, you know, what you the techniques that you sort of use to create your, 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 your art, right? But he's saying that when there's a conflict between, you know, saying something important, basically, and style, that, that he'll, he'll sacrifice style, basically, to, 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 you know, reveal a greater truth about the world. And it's interesting that he picks Mozart, right? Because it's music, you know? I mean, I mean it's hard to think of music as political, you know, especially if it doesn't have lyrics to it, right? I mean, I mean, to, to, the, to the extent that we do think of music, most people think of music as being, you know, you know, political, it's, it's because, you know, there's something in the lyrics that make it, you know, you know, political. But what he's talking about here is just the music itself. Uh, up to Schoenberg and Picasso, great artists have been mistrustful of style, which at decisive points has guided them less than the logic of the subject matter. What the expressionist and Dadaists attacked in their polemics, the untruth of style as such triumphs today in the vocal jargon of the crooner, in the ad up grace of the film star, and even in the mastery of the photographic shot of a farm laborer's hovel. So again, style over substance. And he's talking about, you know, the smooth, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if he's talking about Frank Sinatra here, when, when, when he refers to the vocal jargon of the crooner. Crooners were sort of the term used for singers back, back in that day, that they were crooning, <laughs> whatever that means, you know, romancing people, I guess, Frank Sinatra, you know, if not him, you know, Bing, Bing Crosby or somebody like that. In the ad of grace of the film star, they're, they're sort of, you know, structured. Um, um, they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, even to this, you know, very day, right? Film people in movies are usually, at least in the starring roles, very photogenic and very, you know, physically fit and in shape and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's a reason for that. It, it sort of speaks to that technical, you know, mastery of things. But again, I mean, when's the last time, you know, you've seen an actor really, you know, I don't know, act in a role that was, you know, like meaningful. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there are some exceptions here. I, I still think there are, I, you know, I don't follow everything that Adorno says. I think there are sort of hidden gems within our popular culture. I think he's much, very, very much paints with a broad brush and too dismissive of everything, but I think, you know, like 90% <laughs> basically of, you know, mass culture kind of is crap, unfortunately. Um, Adrian asked, would he consider natural paintings that depict far scenes as not real art since they aren't uh, political? Um, yeah, I would say he would, he wouldn't consider them real art, especially in today's world. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of, part of what he considers art is, is sort of this sort of evolution of art. So, so that real artists are people who are already sort of pushing the techniques of art to its furthest limits. And we, and we kind of talked about this when we went over, you know, painting a little bit when we were talking about Benjamin, but you can see, sort of see this very definite evolution of the techniques of painting, where, where you go from naturalism to abstract art, you know, fully abstract art in basically about, you know, like 50 years or so. So anyone that sort of lags behind that, that sort of evolution, yeah, he, he, would, he would sort of, you know, consider that not, not real art. And, you know, I said that when, when we went over that, I mean, I, I don't, I find a lot of abstract art, you know, it leaves me kind of cold a lot of it. I mean, I can understand it intellectually speaking. I can understand, again, this sort of theory of pushing technique to its furthest limits. 
Um, I actually do definitely do prefer the impressionist painters or the post impressionist painters um, who didn't necessarily paint realistic looking landscapes, but to me, at least kind of found sort of like more of a happy middle ground between, you know, um, realism and, and sort of the more subjective aspects of, of, of art, where at least you're, you're, you're sort of seeing some kind of, you know, picture of the outside world. It's, it's not just completely turned inward, which is what you get in a lot of abstract art, where it's just purely the, the sort of inward emotional state of mind or being of, of, of the artist, which is sort of depicted onto the painting. A lot of that stuff does kind of leave me feeling a little cold. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, it's this idea of sort of, you know, pushing, pushing technique to, to, to its limits is important. But again, also at the same time, never sort of sacrificing the content, never sort of sacrificing the, the imperative on any real artist to, again, to, to give some sort of expression to suffering, as, as, as he says here. Or again, to, to raise a protest against society, basically. Um, now, you know, uh, for that matter, I mean, there are lots of ways that you can interpret it. So it, are depicting the, you know, beauties of nature, is that a protest against a world which is increasingly, you know, becoming, you know, industrialized and, and, and we just sort of live in this, this, this tech, technological bubble? Are you, to some extent, protesting that by, by sort of, you know, depicting the beauty of the natural world? There might be, you know, an argument that you can make for that. I mean, you know, I think there's lots of different ways that, that you can that you can sort of interpret this. And, and I, I don't think there's just one, one correct theory <laughs> on how art should be produced. But, but, but I'm, I'm just trying to more or less express, you know, Adorno's take on it, uh, which I think is pretty much, you know, accurate, to, at, at least to what he thought about it. Um, the last part, right, when he says, even in the mastery of, of the photographic shot of a farm laborer's ho hovel. So what he's talking about, you know, you, you would see a lot of photographers. Um, there's one woman in particular, her name is escaping me off the top of my head, but would, you know, in, 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 in the 1930s, you know, depict, you know, the conditions of people during the depression. And, you know, what he's saying there is that, you know, even people that are, ostensibly trying to portray something, um, you know, to portray some kind of suffering or, 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 or to portray people that are disadvantaged by, by, by the social system, that even that sort of tendency to, to rely so much on technical detail, on getting people in the perfect lighting and getting people in the perfect composition and things like that, that even that can sort of, you know, predominate too much basically over depicting the, the content. In other words, I think what we're talking about here is, 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 is there should be kind of like a, a rawness to art, right? It shouldn't be too polished. It shouldn't be too technical. It should be technical up to, to an extent because you need obviously some kind of technique. But, but the, the, the brutal truth of, 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 of the art, I think, is, is what should stand out, you know, at least as much, if, if not more. So on that note, now I mentioned Schoenberg, Schoenberg. Uh, which I think is important. It's, it's, it's not a reference I should just pass by. So um, Schoenberg was a famous Austrian composer um, who Adorno actually studied under, or actually more so with, with one of Schoenberg's pupils known as Alban Berg, who Adorno studied with. And these were very important composers in the early 20th century. Um, now, again, Adorno's background is in music. Um, his earliest writings were sort of re reviews, you know, published articles, re reviewing, you know, concerts and things like that. Uh, music always played a very big role, important role in his writing and, and his influence. He even, I think, uh, composed some pieces of music himself. Um, so it's something obviously very important here. And, and, and I think... In that regard, um, I, um, I want to try to play a little bit of, of, of that music, not, not, not very much, but just to give a sense of, of, of the kind of art that he's talking about. Because again, we're talking about music here that doesn't have any lyrics. Um, uh, this is a very weird kind of rap. My hair on saying, well, music around the real have so many paintings on display which are not meant to have any political value, especially as you believe that art has less value when there's a political agenda behind it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the dominant view of the society, but he's not, you know, expressing that, that dominant view. He's sort of pushing back against that. And I would say that a lot of, a lot of the paintings do, do have a kind of, you know, political concept to it. 
you know, at, at the very least, if they're, you know, sort of critiquing or sort of undermining sort of the, the, the dominant values of society. I think a lot of that is there. I think a lot of that is there in the, in the impressionist painters who, again, you know, sort of sh shifted the focus from, you know, depicting the so-called great figures of history or religious, you know, symbolism to depicting scenes of ordinary life, including oftentimes, you know, working class people. Um, Picasso's paintings oftentimes were, you know, political. I mean, I mean, the meaning of it could be very dense, or it, it, it's 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 not quite clear what what he's intending in, in a lot of them. But certainly, you know, a painting like Wernicke, which we did, you know, talk about in, in class, is obviously a very you know political painting. So I I would say that that's uh, you know there's some some merit to that. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, uh, how, how you would evaluate the, the, the political content of all, all of these paintings. I think a lot of them are, a lot of the paintings that are considered, you know, famous paintings or classical paintings are. Um, if a lot of them aren't, you know, I mean, well, who, who are the people that, you know, select them for museums? It, it largely is, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, a bourgeois class anyway. Um, but I would, uh, I think, uh, you know, the politics of a lot of these paintings, again, even if it's not always that explicit, I think, is, is usually there. Even if it's just something, like, like I said, just depicting ordinary people instead of the, the elite, basically, which is what a lot of, you know, uh, painting, you know, prior to the Impressionists did. Anyway, so, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear, think what people think of this music. So, you know, when I, when I studied this stuff when I was in college, you know, the professor never actually played any of the music in, in class, which I think, you know, I, I guess, obviously, he was leaving it up to people to, to seek it out on, on their own. But, um, you know, I think that's maybe it wasn't as easy to do in, in, in class back then. But now that it's, it's more or less easy to do, I think it's obviously important to do so. So you don't just understand what he's talking about in, in a theoretical sense, right? I, I mean, it's important to actually sort of experience this and see what, what he's talking about here. So I'm going to play a little bit of Schoenberg. I'm going to play a little bit of Berg. And, okay, I'm sharing my screen. I'm kind of curious as to what people... Think of it. Now, I'll, I'll be the first one to, to admit, I, I have no formal background in music. I mean, like most people, I grew up listening to popular music. I mean, I, I, I enjoy some of this stuff, but I, I don't think I really fully understand the, the intellectual aspects of it. Uh, this is also often known as a, atonal music. So it, it plays with a different sort of system of literally like music making or making tones than what you'd see in a lot of classical music. So, and again, it's, it's hard to think of, um, you know, music being political that doesn't have, explicitly have lyrics, but he, he would say that this is political. So let's, let's, let's give a listen and see what we get out of this. Hopefully an ad doesn't play in the middle of it. <laughs>
probably not a good place to stop it. So I'll just stop there. So I'm, I'm wondering what people think about that. Now, again, you know, my own sort of limited vocabulary of music. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, write, write, write a paper about this or anything like that. But certainly there's a kind of a, for lack of a better term, kind of a uh, sort of spooky quality that <laughs> comes out about this music. Um, as an expression of suffering, does it express the suffering? It seems to express some kind of anguish. It's more modern than Beethoven, for example. Uh, there's definitely a lot going on in the song right off the bat and switches between moods fairly quickly despite it being only two minutes in. Yeah, that's a good insight, actually. Um, again, you know, I don't know much about music, but yeah, I mean, the, the change of moods, um, yeah, is an important point to, to uh, pick up. It doesn't have a pattern it follows from, from, from the beginning. Yeah, I think that's kind of what's, what's characteristic. <laughs> Sounds like a soundtrack for 1930s black and white film, like Metropolis. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Uh, the idea of it not having a pattern. Yeah, I think that's pretty much kind of the idea of what, of what is called uh, atonal music. Oh, I'm classically trained in piano and D minor is apparently the saddest, most melancholy key in music, but uses it chaotically. Just go, okay, good. That's, that's very interesting. See, I, I didn't know any, anything about that. D minor is apparently the saddest, most melancholy key in music. Very interesting. Um, well, all right, so let me, let me play another piece. So this is, will be then, uh, Alban Berg, who, why am I, I'm trying, to, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to escape out of this. Okay. Close this window, bring this one up. So Berg was a student of Schoenberg who, um, Adorno actually studied with, and, uh, Adorno actually was, uh, you know, like friendly with, I mean, I mean, Berg died for, uh, very young. He died in 1935. I think he was only about 50 years old. Uh, and this is, this is known as the Lulu suite. Uh, this is the last, uh, really thing that he did before his death. I believe it was, you know, uh, incomplete at the time of his death. Um, Chopin. Yeah. Chopin. So yeah. Um, Chopin's another person I like as well have a wildly different feel to it. It seems, yeah, and Chopin's known for, you know, the nocturnes, you know, night music. Uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, described it somewhat ignorantly as, you know, spooky, <laughs> spooky music, which again speaks to my limited vocabulary here. Um, but it is, you know, I think it's, it is interesting to consider music, something that's not, you know, has lyrics to it. And so to consider how it might express a mood, how it might even, you know, express a kind of, you know, political content. And, and especially keeping in mind this idea of, you know, giving voice to the voiceless and expression of suffering, protesting against society. It seems like, well, let me play this first before I get ahead of myself. So this was left incomplete, I believe, at the time of Bird's death. Oh my God, is there an ad playing? Oh, this is horrible. No, no offense to people. Well, this happens. <clears throat>
All right. Obviously, I want to get that big climax <laughs> in there. Or, well, it's not really the climax, but. Um, uh, Berg describes more to traditional phrasing composition than Schoenberg, very romantic period sounding. Okay. So it sounds like you have a background in music as well, or at least understand it uh, fairly well. Um, yeah, from what I've read about Berg, that, that, that is correct, actually. Um, but again, I think there are, oh, interesting, classically trained in, in piano as well. Um, okay, so again, I think this is a good exercise in, you know, like I said, I mean, Adorno leaves very little clues as to what he regards as, you know, genuine art. He's, he's you know, known for his, you know, critical stand towards, you know, popular art or popular culture, mass culture, or whatever you want to call it. And in fact, he, he prefers using the term culture in the street because he doesn't want people to think that you know when you use the term like mass culture or popular culture that the masses or you know popular taste have any real say in dictating what gets produced that it is very much a kind of top-down thing but he's very you know obviously known for his critique of these things you you you, you don't get that many insights into what he does regard as, as genuine art or true art and this is you know these would be some examples of that and again i think it speaks to this idea that it doesn't have to be explicitly Political. It doesn't have to be like you know, rage against the machine lyrics or, or something like that. If you're if you're familiar with that group at all, um, this is not explicitly political, right? I mean, I mean, there's nothing about this that that, that stands out obviously and and, and 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 states its political intent. But it's more about, I guess, capturing a certain mood. Again, if if, if we sort of hone in on 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 the, on the on the sort of the key phrases that Adorno uses, an expression of suffering you know, giving voice to the voiceless, protesting against a petrified, a petrified society. It, it, I, I think these pieces do kind of communicate that. And, and, and maybe, you know, reading the stuff, you know, beforehand kind of helps sort of key you into that if you're not as classically, you know, if you're not classically trained in music, perhaps. Um, and what, I, what I'm getting at is at least is, is that I, I would think that Adorno, what, what he doesn't like or what he doesn't regard as, as true art and what he sees as a problem of the culture industry is, Art that's too, I guess, positive, too affirmative, too sort of happy, happy go lucky, which is a lot of stuff that we get right out of, out of the culture industry. It's all about sort of you know establishing a good mood, and, and everyone's supposed to be happy and upbeat and act like life is one bit one big party. And you know, I mean, think of the, of course there is a major taboo in this society about being seen as being too negative or something like that. Um, I guess what they would say to that is that, well, yeah, like why should people be all, all, all that happy? Not to say that you can't find moments of happiness in your personal life, but I mean, like when you're thinking of society as, as a whole, I mean, what really is there to be that happy about thing? I mean, we live, you know, and of course, then you just have to bring out the, the various dysfunctional aspects of American society, the racism, the classism, the homophobia, the sexism, the, the, Imperialism, all, all these, all these aspects. You know, the the lack of decent health care, the lack of decent education, the, the fact we have so many homeless people in, in the country, the fact that so many people's you know living standards are are going down. So the fact that we have a culture that's constantly trying to sort of uplift people, uh, and, and, and a kind of you know a, a false up, uplifting. I, th I think that's how what, what he would say. He's he, he, he's not necessarily against being uplifted. But I think what he's saying is that is that what we get in, in, in the culture industry is this kind of false affirmation, this sort of false, unearned kind of positivity, sort of you know ha happy, happy go lucky nature, which of course is easy to contrast this music with again something by Frank Sinatra or you know like something like that, or, or, or even you know popular 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 music today. I'm sure he he would hate that Pharrell Williams song, right? I'm I'm so happy. I'm sure that's exactly like the kind of thing that he would uh, really react against. Whoops, did that again. All right, so that's the second example. I have a couple more, not, not, not necessarily musical pieces, but let me go back to my PowerPoint real quick, move things around here. We still have some time. <clears throat> so this is actually then a, uh, 
a uh, image from Burke's staging of Wozzeck, which was an opera, probably what he's most known, known for. This would have been then an actual picture from the actual staging of the opera uh, in the 1920s. Um, again, you can see almost like kind of sort of Gothic style. I mean, at, at the time, you know, German expressionism was, was, was very big. Uh, also seems to, you know, speak to that as well. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that though. Um, we've already talked about this categorizing everyone sort of fits into a different category um capitalist production hems them in hems people in so tightly in body and soul that they unresistingly succumb to whatever is proffered to them however just as the rule have always taken the morality dispensed to them by the rulers more seriously than the rulers themselves the defrauded masses today cling to the myth of success still more ardently than the successful they too have their aspirations. They insist unwaveringly on the ideology by which they are enslaved. The pernicious love of the common people for the harm done to them outstrips even the cunning of the authorities. So what I get out of this passage here is that, you know, Adorno seems to hit on something which I think, again, still very much resonates today, which is that people essentially trade, you know, true freedom away for consumerism. They trade real freedom for, you know, the limited, you know, pleasure they can derive from, from buying shit, you know, which is mass produced and, you know, just, you know, churned out, might as well be coming out of it and assembly line anyway. And this lack of, you know, real freedom, I think is, is, is something that I, I think does resonate with a lot of people. And again, you know, America coming out of World War II, I think that lack of freedom was, you know, concealed by a lot of things. Uh, at least for certain groups of people, you know, if, if, if you were, let, let's say, a, a, a hetero, you know, white man living in America, um, you still weren't really free in, in the sense that you had any real say, of course, on anything that was going on in the country, any of the directions which, which the country was heading in, you know, on the, on the big important issues. But at least you were able to sort of share in that, that, that post-war, uh, you know, uh, prosperity, basically which of course, you know, the U.S. enjoyed more, more, more than any other country. And, and to a certain extent, that was true for, you know, white women as well, though not as much, right? I mean, I mean, obviously there was a hierarchy there. Um, and of course, obviously, black people did not get to enjoy in that prosperity very often. And we're, we're very much aware of, of, of their own lack of freedom. I don't think that, that, that was a question at, at all. Um, if you were non-hetero, uh, yeah, you know, it, m much like being, you know, a Jewish person who changes their, their, their name to, you know, past in society. If, if you lived in the closet, you know, the, 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 then you could uh, sort of get by, but uh, obviously you had to, you know, suppress who, who you are. Um, so that lack of freedom was always there, even for the so-called dominant majority of people, but it was somewhat concealed by post-war prosperity. Now, however, you know, when that prosperity is kind of worn off, I mean, the lack of freedom, I think, is, is very obvious for, for everybody. I mean, and, and again, the lack of health care, the lack of, of education, the lack of, you know, affordable education, I should say. And, and affordable means free. You know, affordable is like, like a term that, you know, like the Democrats use for saying like, well, we won't, you know, uh, <laughs> have, have too, too high of an interest rate on the student loans that you have to pay. Well, why not just have no student loans? Why not have tuition free, you know, public college? If you want to go to private college, you know, that's, that's another thing. But public schools, you know, public colleges in this country historically have been free too, by the way. It's only in, in basically since, since, since the 1980s where, you know, tuition was introduced in a, a lot of that. But things like that, I mean, obviously stand out. Um, you know, the, you know the, the, the decline in living standards and, and things like that. I, I mean, I, mean I, I, I could go on, obviously, and a lot of the stuff we've already talked about. But, you know, the, the lack of freedom today, I think, is very obvious. But, you know, even, even now, many people are willing to sort of trade that for some kind of consumer gratification, even though they have basically no say at all in the political directions that the country moves in and any say really in any of the big important decisions that are made on a uh, society-wide level. Um, and, and I think, you know, I mean, going back to what we were saying before about so, social media, I think that plays a role in that as as well. I mean, Benjamin talks about that, right? Where, where he says that, you know, fascism basically gives people, you know, a, a means of self-expression, even while denying them basic rights. And it's a fascinating way to looking at fascism, because it's not the first thing that stands out. But then when you think about it, it, it kind of makes sense, because fascism, 
or generally are these movements that are just sort of overflowing with emotion and things like that and does allow for self-expression, you know, provided, of course, that you, you, you go down the sort of, you know, the means, the channels that the state has provided for you. But it does allow for that. But what it doesn't give you, of course, are, you know, basic human rights like health care, education and housing and, and you know, a, a, a means of getting by. Um, so I think that's an interesting way of looking at, you know, contemporary society as, as well, where we have ample means of expression. But what we're lacking, of course, are those basic human rights. So anyway, I'll, I'll move on because we are running out of time. I think that's, uh, you know, obviously one of the most important insights. And I think this is why you, you, you can't just dismiss Adorno as being a snob because he realizes the, the, the political importance of this and the political consequences of this as well. And how this is very much, you know, antithetical to democracy. That you can't have a democratic government where, where, where people are just, you know, sort of in this sort of consumer-induced stupor or coma while, while they're being, you know, denied, you know, again, of, of, of basic human necessities. So here's another interesting passage. Uh, he, uh, he says it calls for Mickey Rooney rather than the tragic Garbo, Donald Duck rather than Betty Boop. The industry bows to the vote. It has itself rigged. Now, I've always gravitated to this passage because, again, it gives you some kind of insight on what he seems to like. He, 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 he seems to speak positively of Greta Garbo, who's the actress pictured here. Uh, again, a very enigmatic figure. I probably don't have, you know, we're well, I'm only about 10 minutes left, so I probably, we're less than 10 minutes left, so I don't have too much time to talk about her. But has anyone ever heard of her before? Just real quick, I don't really have too much time to talk about it, but a very interesting per personality. Uh, one of the few people who really made the transition from, from the silent film era to sound film, you know, from the 1920s through, through, through the 1930s, and then basically walked away from it in the early 1940s when she was still a young woman, uh, only in her, you know, 30s. I believe she was, uh, you know, basically around the same age as Marilyn Monroe was when she died. And basically, you know, after 1941, 1942, whenever it was, she made her, her last movie. She would have been about 35, I think 36 years old, which I think is the same age as Marilyn Monroe. She retired and never made a movie again. I think that's kind of a, an interesting thing because, I mean, when else has that ever happened? When else do you know of a successful actor who just retires in, in their 30s and, and never does anything again? And, 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 the, and the reaction to it is interesting as, as well, because a lot of people, you know, describe her as being a tragic figure. They're like, why is she tragic? She wasn't homeless. I mean, she was an incredibly wealthy person, lived in New York City. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think her, her, her net worth when she died was like $50 million or something like that in, you know, 1990 when she died. It would be a lot more money today. What's 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 tragic about that? No, uh, Monroe. No, she was out of it by by then. Marilyn Monroe kind of comes about you know the 1950s, maybe the late 1940s. Greta Garbo by the early 1940s was done. She she was in movies in the 20s and in the 30s, and then by the early 1940s she basically you know stopped stopped making movies. Uh, but lived a long life. Like I said, lived to uh, I think she was in her 80s when when she died. I think she was about 85 or something like that when she died. I think to me it's very you know, interesting because, you know, again, I mean, I mean, you wouldn't really see many people do that, do that now. So many people just seem so desperate for, you know, like the spotlight, quite frankly. Anyway, an even weirder reference is that he refers to Betty Boop. That's why I'm kind of running through this fast. I like, I like Greta Garbo a lot. But unfortunately, I don't have time to talk more about her. But I did want to play this, this, this clip from a Betty Boop cartoon. So he, so he mentions it, you know, f uh, favorably compared to Donald Duck, which of course is the famous Disney character. So what could he possibly like about Betty Boop? <laughs> um, well, I have something here, which I'd like to show. Oh, I also had something by Mar Marlena Dietrich, who's a German actress. Of course, I don't have time, time to show that as either. Um, but keeping in mind, you know, what, what we just experienced with the music, I think if you watch this cartoon, and, and, and it's, it's a small excerpt from it, uh, the full thing is about seven minutes long. This is, you know, uh, only a couple minutes. It's it's basically the Betty Boo version of Snow White, and 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 kind of you know, it's kind of like an edited version, like I said, that basically you know gets to the real signature part of it. Off with her head. Uh-huh. 
Look at the background here. That's that's what really stands out, I think. Very weird. Let her go, let her go, oh bless her. Wherever she may be, she will search this wide world over. But she never find another sweet man like me. Now when I die, baby, in my straight leg bridges. Put on a box back coat and a studs in a hat. Put a twenty dollar gold piece on my watch chain so you can let all the boys know I died standing pat. Then give me six rap shooting ball bearers. Let a chorus girl sing me a song. Put a red We go along, folks. Now that you have heard my story, say, boy, hand me over another shot of that blues. If anyone should ask you, tell them I got those St. James in very blue. Pretty uh, weird stuff. So again, you know, I mean, what 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 stands out about that? To me, at least, I mean, you know, besides the animation is very, you know, fluid. That's that, that's the singer Cab Calloway, who you know Adorno was famously critical of popular music and jazz. So I don't think that's what he he likes about it. But if you look at those backgrounds, they're very you know you know bizarre with all the skulls, you know, skeletons and stuff. And if we, you know, link this up to the music of, you know, with uh, Schoenberg and Berg, there seems to be a kind of, you know, thematic uh, resonance there. And again, the, you know, the Betty Boop character, I guess, was, a, I guess, sort of considered sort of sexually explicit back then. Uh, you know, she was in, 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 the, in the mold of a, of a 1920s, you know, what they called, you know, flapper back then. Uh, one of his most famous phrases here, you know, he, he refers to the culture industry as be, being both pornographic and prudish meaning it is sort of, you know, stimulates erotic desire while, while not, you know, providing any real satisfaction, compares it to the ritual of Tantalus from Greek mythology, you know, uh, what you want is just within reach, but you can never grab it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm running through pretty quickly because we're, we're basically out of time. But as far as the, the midterm goes, I'll, 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 I'll post the questions uh, later on. I'll send out an announcement for it. But basically, for sure and answer questions, you know, I mean, it, it says this on, on the syllabus, basically. Um, you know, one to, one to two paragraphs long or one, one to three paragraphs long, um, covering, you know, some of the main concepts that we went in class, right? Marx's concept of alienation, Lukash's idea of reification, Benjamin's idea of the aura, and then finally this idea of the culture industry. The, the, these all refer to basically, you know, the main concepts, the main ideas of, of the readings that we've gone over so far. So if you can explain those terms, maybe in one paragraph, and then maybe, you know, give an example of how that plays out, uh, that would be good. And I think that would be a good response to make, uh, to write. And that'll basically be, be it. So maybe about, you know, two, two, two paragraphs long. One basically explaining the meaning of the concept. One, one paragraph basically, you know, trying to apply this concept, you know, in, in, in a real world circumstance. And again, I'll, 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 I'll post an, an announcement with this uh, after class. Um, but we're pretty much out of time. So does anyone have any questions here for me about anything? It's an interesting uh, topic, the culture industry, but, you know, unfortunately, as usual, 
run out of time. All right. So, you know, I hope you enjoyed some of these things. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, Adorno's, you know, take on 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 these various uh, art forms, you know, and obviously we're not done with the class. So there's more to uh, explore after this. After after the midterm, we'll be looking at the book Eros and Civilization, which also sort of you know takes sort of you know Freudian concepts and sort of applies it to understanding capitalism. So I think that'll be interesting to look at as well. All right. So if there's no other questions, then uh, I guess we're done here. So have a good day, everyone. Take care. Okay,